Shitarade, Shitayande. Speaking tongues. Please. Brado Shilada, Siata. Father God, we give this day to you. Father God, we honor you this day. Let your cloud continually prevail over us. Supply your rain and rain in our hearts. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. Thank you. Praise God. Today we are talking about the tribe of Judah. It's a very small thing. I can share it in 5-10 minutes. But uh, I decided to add, add on flesh. So if we end up using two hours, it is because I put too much flesh. Praise the living God. The tribe of Judah, we have all heard of the lion, the lion, right? Of the tribe of 
Judah. Jesus is from the tribe of Judah. Kingship prevails in the tribe of Judah. Praise God. So this is a royal tribe. This is a selected tribe, a special tribe. But in effect, today we are studying about the characters of the Christian. We studied the tribe of, of Reuben, but what we're really studying is the character of a Christian. Last week I said firstborn. It's not really about a firstborn. How together? We simply highlighted that way, and it actually does relate to maybe firstborns here and there. But what about if you're lastborn and you in the authority of a firstborn? If you were Joseph, and we read that Joseph received the birthright away from, from Reuben. And yet today you're going to find that even Judah had that same birthright. I may not give you a scripture today. So what I'm saying today is the Bible applies to you in all ways. Identify the traits about you that are in what we're going to share and hold on to them. They will be your identity. Hold on to them. They will be your identity. Praise the living God. Okay. I'll start with Proverbs 21.1. This is just to introduce. The Bible says the king's heart is in the hand of, of God or in the hand of the Lord. The riv as the rivers as the rivers of water, he turns it wheresoever he will. Praise God. Remember we shared about Reuben? The Bible says that he's unstable as water. If your heart is equated to water, then you're very unstable. But the Bible is telling us that the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As the rivers of water, he turns it wheresoever side he will. So, yes, we may have a heart like water, it may be unstable, but if it's in the hand of God, he will turn it this direction he wills to turn it. And if God is the one turning it, then you know you are safe. Amen? But however, this can apply in another way, the different connotations. But once you're king, don't think you're in charge. Once you're king, once you've received grace, you've received gifts, you've received anointing, don't think you're the one in charge. Remember, your identity remains God. Amen? Praise God. Praise God. We're going to read the scripture again. We read it last week. Genesis 29, 31 to 35. The reason we're reading it is to identify the character traits attached to all the meanings of the names. Genesis 29, 31 to 35. The Bible reads, 31. And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. So the one that was loved, the Lord made her barren. So when one is not fruitful, do not laugh at them. They are still in God's plan. And then those that are very fruitful, they are still in God's plan, but does not make them better than the one that is yet to be. Amen? And Leah conceived and bare a son, and she called his name Reuben. For she said, Surely the Lord God has looked upon my affliction. Now therefore, my husband will love me. And we all know that it did not happen. 33. And she conceived again and bare a son and said, Because the Lord has heard that I, I was hated, he has therefore given me this son also. And she called his name Simeon. And she conceived again and bare a son and said, Now this time will my husband join unto me, because I have borne him three sons. Therefore was his name called Levi. And she conceived again and bare a son. And she said, Now I will praise the Lord. Therefore she called his name Judah and left bearing. Praise the living God. Now the first three sons, she's trying to work out a blessing. She's trying to help God. She's trying to lure her husband. She's trying to win her husband. One son was not enough. Second son was not enough. Third son was not enough. Until she put all that aside and decided that I will worship God. That is when she had a son called Judah. Praise God. Now we see that Reuben was born in weird circumstances. And uh, we know the life of Reuben was turbulent because of the temperament of the mother. Now here we have Judah. The mother's temperament is the temperament of worship. So many of us are born 
and our mothers possibly are going through something. Maybe they are happy. Maybe they are this. Maybe they are that. And many times the temperament of your mother may actually determine how your child will behave. You've been told as mothers, pray over your pregnancy. Prophesy over them. Speak over them. Talk to the child. The child hears you. In effect, you're actually releasing blessings unto them. That one you know. Those who are mothers, you know this. A child is born and then they can, they can already identify your voice. Praise God. Today we are saying, be like Leah when she gave birth to Judah. Forget all your circumstances, forget all your pain and commit these children unto God. And you're going to find out that Judah was a bit special compared to, say, Reuben, who was the firstborn. We already saw Reuben, so we know. Praise God. I'll read you Proverbs 22, 24 to 25. The Bible says, Make no friendship with an angry man, and with a furious man thou shalt not go, lest thou learn his ways and get a snare to thy soul. Now, this woman was not happy because she knew she was not loved. What was she good for? She was good for production, for bringing forth children. Remember, they shortchanged the father, right? He had to work twice. That was not meant to be his wife. Today we started by talking about an introduction and uh, a boyfriend. Already there is a problem, but we have to pray the blessing of God upon these people. Many of us come from homes where there are many mothers, maybe many fathers, maybe this and that and that. And you find that these, fine, you all seem to be prospering as children, but there is a problem. When they ask you, who is your brother, you first identify the ones of your mother alone. Then, like, hey, okay, this is my brother also. Praise God, we know what we're talking about, right? But we're saying today, move away from pain, anger, whatever it is, Move away from working for a blessing. Move away from that. Continually praise God. And everything about you shall be praiseworthy. Praise the living God. Praise God. So Judah really means worship. That is a way I would summarize it. I'll read Genesis 49, 8 to 12. This is the father of Judah blessing him. Remember we said Jacob, while he was not called a prophet, he was actually a prophet. And he was responsible for blessing these families. And whatever he did, Moses the deliverer in Deuteronomy 33 came and pronounced other blessings to correct some of the ones that were, were count, working contrary against these tribes. Because these tribes still belong to God. And I've said today, when you seem to be prospering in a thing, do not think you're better than the one who is not. Last week we shared that this woman who had very many sons, when Joseph, when, was it, what's her name, Rachel? Rachel had Joseph and, and Benjamin. And we find that Joseph really became Joseph. He needed only one son for everything to reflect the glory of God. So be patient like today. Have your identity, wait on God, and it will come to you. It will come to you, surely. Praise God. Genesis 49, 8 to 12. Judah, thou art, this is the father pronouncing, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Even the father is saying he shall be praised. And we're seeing that the mother's temperament was also praised. And yet I don't want to think the father knew what the mother had declared. But you find that it has followed this guy and his brothers shall praise him. Thy hand shall be in the neck of your enemies. He will always prevail. Your father's children shall bow down before you. Is this not what was supposed to happen with Joseph as well? So the, basically we are saying there is praise, there is honor, there is authority, there is power. But together, 
Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up, stooped down, and couched as a lion. And as an old lion. He is very patient. A lion doesn't just pounce. It calculates. By the time it pounces, it's too late for you. Amen? So this is a man who is given to God. That when he does what he does, it is properly calculated and it will prevail. Praise the living God. Verse 10, the scepter, this one I like, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come. Shiloh, traditionally, a day of praise. Let us keep it at that for now. But a scepter is a stick, like, like the staff of Moses, right? But it, is, it highlights authority. Kingship, not just any authority. It highlights kingship. So this guy was also a spiritual leader. And yet, spiritual leadership was ideally given to Levi. Does that make sense? So we're seeing that this guy is really an, uh, an heir to his father. Amen? Spiritual leadership is also given to him. Until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. People will, he's going to be a leader. They'll come to him. He's a spiritual leader, but he's also a king. Amen? 11. Binding his fall unto the vine, and his ass called unto the choice vine. He washed, washed his garments in wine and his clothes in blood of grapes. His eyes shall be red as one, with wine, and his teeth white as milk. Now, all this is symbol, symbolism. We already know what this is talking about. The wine, the spirit, the blood, Christ. White teeth, the, the purity that God has given us. So this guy is a spiritual leader, but he's also a king. He's a man of authority. He's a man that is calculative. He's a man that is patient, but he's a man that does not lose. Amen? Praise the living God. Now, look at yourself especially in the family setting. You don't have to be the firstborn. Or you can even be the firstborn, but you find that authority is given to you. How? Every time something is going to happen, they first call you. That we want to buy cake for... I don't, maybe you have a little kid. Let us call her Sarah. For Sarah's birthday, they first call you. Uh, you don't know how to bake. Now together. Any, even your own parents start to consult with you. You know what I'm talking about, some of you. Even your parents consult with you. Something is going on with your other sibling, they call you first. Family meeting, without you, it cannot happen. And yet in the meeting, you're just going to sit and say nothing. And just say yes. It's okay. It is true. Am I lying? So, consider that this trait is given unto you. It is natural, but it is also spiritual. And then if you don't attend the meeting, they are going to meet you after and quarrel with you because you didn't attend the meeting. You know, you know, we need your input, we need what? Like, what input? You felt the meeting was useless, but they need you. It's not that they don't think. It is authority bestowed upon you. Me and my dad said these words, to me in the presence of all my siblings or maybe the ones who are present at the time he said that this one is my heir because he will protect you spiritually and naturally I want to pretend that I didn't understand what he was saying but I'm not the first born I'm not the second born not together and this is true in your life even if the parent has not told you you somehow know you just know you just know if your parents, usually when you're a leader of that kind, your parents usually favor the younger ones more than you. Okay, not younger ones, the others. They do things for others more than you. And if you, if you don't have that identity, if you don't recognize that identity, you'll feel like they are neglecting you. But a Judah does not feel that way. He's always in the lead. He's always the solution. He does not covet he does not get jealous. 
He's a solution person. And solution people usually are not liked. Because and solution people are not very patient. Because while you're presenting your story, they already have the answer. They tell you, you know what, it's okay. Just do this, that, 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 that. chapter closed. Like, but now you, you you're a dictator. <laughs> You've seen those things. You know what I'm talking about. This is a trait that you carry by virtue of the fact that you're born again. If you're born again and you're beggarly, you're weak, then look for another tribe. Amen? And do not in any way repent for who you are. It's a gift from God. It is a gift from God. We are picking character from the Bible. I can teach character using psychology, the ones they have taught you outside there. But the one of the Bible is, is pertinent to your spirit. It's established. And as we speak, you start to recognize who you are. We have said you need to know your identity. If you don't know your identity, then you're in trouble. Then you'll be like... Uh, You'll not be like, what's her name? Rebecca, right? No one will look for you. People look for identity. Praise God. Praise the living God. So we are seeing that the scepter shall not depart from Judah. That is what I may focus on today. This is the man that has no weaknesses. Have you seen any weakness? He has no Weakness. When his father was blessing him, he had no weakness. Just because you stagger and stumble in certain things, that is learning, that is a school. That is a school. It's not a weakness. Altogether, a weakness is something that has consumed you and you have no control. I doubt that there is anything that is in your life that you cannot manage to control if you're from the tribe of Judah. The tribe of Judah people are overthinkers. They plan everything out. And when you're with people like this, be careful what you say. They will remember everything. And they will remember even the things that you did not say. Because they're able to read you like a book. All together. So de determine which tribe you belong to. Praise the living God. Praise the living God. Okay. I'm just giving you a story. You pick the part that is relevant to you. Now, an, an example of his leadership. I'm going to use biblical examples. We read this last week already. But you remember when Reuben offered his two sons to his father. That uh, when they were, they were, Joseph asked for Benjamin to be brought. And Reuben told the father, let my two sons be killed if I don't bring him back. Now, this is what Judah did. For him, Genesis 37, 26, 28 said, And Judah said unto his brethren, What profit is it if we slay our brother? Now, this is before they sold him. I'm giving you traits of Judah. When they were to sell him, Judah is the one who saved his life. And when they were bringing Joseph from, from Egypt now to meet their father, Judah was the one that led also. It should have been Reuben. And then when it came to taking Benjamin to meet Joseph, it was still Judah that did it. Where was Reuben? The real firstborn. So I'm going to read this. And Judah said unto his brethren, What profit is it? If we slay our brother, if we kill our brother and conceal his blood, come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh. And his brethren were content. Then there passed by, passed by Midianites and merchant men, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver and they brought Joseph to Egypt. Remember, the name Judah is the name Judas. All together. We'll read it in the New Testament. The name Judah is the name Judas. And we know that who sold who? Who sold Jesus? 
Judas. So again here, the man possibly knows business. Wasn't Judas an accountant? We, we traditionally call him the accountant of God. So this guy is reflective of the other guy as well. Praise the living God. So he saves Joseph's life by not killing him. Then he's able to influence his brothers and he's able to negotiate even the price. Where is Reuben at this time? He's not nowhere to be seen. It's in the end where he comes looking in the pit. Where did you put the guy? Him, he wanted to impress the father. And some of you have siblings like that, right? They take on the, the smaller, smaller, smaller things to impress. You have suffered for six months taking care of maybe your, your auntie. Maybe she broke a leg. You're the one who drove her to hospital and back. You're the one who massaged. You're the one who this. Then when your auntie heals, your sibling brings a cake. And the aunt is, oh, thank you, my child. For you, no one has told you, thank you, my child. If you're not a Judah, you're going to get heartbroken. But a Judah is satisfied in service. And their reward is sure. You've, you've seen situations like this. Praise God. Praise God. Where, Joseph, where Judah led Joseph... I don't know if I should read it, but it's in uh, Genesis 46, 27. I'll read it quickly. And the sons of Joseph, which were born in Egypt, were two souls. All the souls of the house of Jacob, which came in, into Egypt, were three co, three co, read your Bible. 28. And he sent Judah before him unto Joseph to direct his face unto Goshen and they came into the land of Goshen and Joseph made ready his chariot and went up to meet Israel his father to Goshen and presented himself unto him and he fell on his neck and wept on his neck a good while. The father trusted Judah. He could have sent Reuben. We're contrasting two names here because we have shared one. He could have sent the firstborn but the firstborn is unstable. Like when we were young, they tell you, go to the shop and bring one kilo of sugar. It is maybe 9 a.m. The next time they see you is 1 p.m. Because you met your friends playing football. That one is understandable for a child. But for an adult, it is not. It's despicable. Praise God. So today, there are people, you can agree in a meeting, maybe even a family meeting. Let me keep it in family. But they will change the plan according to what they want and they come and everything you planned was nothing. You should never have had the meeting. That's why a Judah will just go and execute and chapter closed. Praise God. Praise God. Then there are scriptures. The tribe of Judah acknowledged David as king when other tribes were refusing him. You'll just write down 1 Samuel 18.16 2 Samuel 2.4 These are simply notes we can share but I don't know if I want to read them. Amen? Now, if we are talking about the tribe of Judah, we have even finished. You go and think about it. You give, uh-huh. And the, man, and the men of Judah came and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah and they told David, saying that the men of, of that one were they, and they buried Saul. So these guys, as soon as Saul departed, they were quick to anoint David. They were quick to recognize him. Other tribes did not. David was a king of one tribe first. He was a king of only one tribe. Then later on, he became a king of two. Then he became a king of Israel. Praise God. 2 Samuel 2 4. Okay. That's the one I've just read. What does the other one say? 1 Samuel 18 16. Praise the living God. But all Israel and Judah loved David because 
he went out and came before him. It is the second scripture that I really preferred. Now, in 1 Kings 6, verse 1, the Bible says, remember we shared that the scepter shall not depart from the house of Judah. Kingship shall not depart from the house of Judah. I'm going to highlight to you how it should have departed. But because it was prophesied, it was spoken, it actually could not be executed. Now here, and Saul said unto David, 18, did I say 1817, that one? 1816. Praise the living God. Has somebody already identified who they are? Have you now understood some of the problems you have at home? Praise God. It's good you've identified. And Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet, you know. First Samuel, not Kings. First Samuel. First Samuel. First Samuel. So today, whether you're firstborn or not, God allows you to prosper for some reason. He allows you to be established for some reason. He gives you a certain kind of mind. I call it a mind that does split-second thinking. You can take a decision in a second. And then you endure a meeting of two hours, and yet and they come back to that same answer. So, in a place of your authority, people will call you arrogant, especially maybe at work, or they will call you difficult. But do not change for anybody. It's a gift from God. Amen? That we already read. Praise the living God. Praise the living God. Give me First Kings six one. This from the time when the scepter the scepter is not to do, to separate from the house of Judah. The king there was no king. You remember that in the Bible, Israel was led by judges, right? They were led by judges, and here it came to. The Bible talks of 480, 480th year after the children of Israel came out of the land of Egypt. In the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month of that, which is the second month of that, 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 that. Basically, we are saying about 480 years, there was no king. Altogether. Remember, in the time of Abraham, you hear of a king here and there. You hear of a king here and there. But from after Jacob, there is no king. And remember, these people are in a strange land because of Joseph, right? They went, and they now had to come back. That was a prophecy given to Abraham by God in Genesis chapter, I believe, 14 or 15. No, 15. Where God told him that the people shall go into exile for 400 years, but it became 430 years. But now there is a spell where there is no king. I'm going to tell you why there was no king. We're going to find it in the Bible why there was no king. So you can be a king, you can be a person of authority, you can be from the tribe of Judah, and your authority is usurped, and you live under judges because of one or two things. So you need to come out and sustain your identity. We already shared about uh, Rebecca. If you have no identity, you can lose your position temporarily. But it will be painful. It will, you'll suffer a lot of loss. That's why sometimes I say, come out boldly. Come out boldly. Fear not. If you're misunderstood, maybe point X, we shall understand you. Jesus was misunderstood, right? But today we understand him. He did not fear to come out. Praise God. Because your, your siblings have bigger muscles than you, does not mean your authority is taken away. Then there are those who, the authority is with you, and because they are older than you, they, don't, they want to put you down. No. You must arise. It's a God-given assignment. You are not born in your family by mistake. You are not born in that order by mistake. Most mothers pray for children before they are even conceived. Forget these accidents of today. Wake up one morning, hey, okay, hey, mommy, I'm sorry. I also don't know what happened. You know what happened. Praise the living God. So, we're going to now, I've said, if I were to talk about Judah, I have finished. But there's a lot more. Now, we're going to examine. We've said that Judah had no, he had no weakness. 
according to the prophecy that was placed on him. But I'm going to show you the weakness of Judah. There's a scripture, I believe, in uh, Ephesians. I believe Ephesians, if I'm not wrong, where there's a sin that easily besets you. There is a sin that easily besets you. Like, to beset is to hem in. We've had a teaching like this before. If you buy a new cloth today and unhelm it, you're going to find there's a bit of dirt inside. Or dust, call it dust. And that dust is synonymous. All clothes have it, whether new or old. Only the one of an old cloth garment will be dirty, maybe. Praise God. So we are going to read from Genesis 38. But maybe before we do so, I'm just going to highlight to you a few things. You remember Caleb in the Bible? Caleb, the one who went with Joshua to spy the promised land, who was from the tribe of Judah. All together, you see that these guys are always in, they are positioned well. And all the old generation, nobody entered into the promised land, not even Moses, but Caleb did. And because of that, he was given a great inheritance. Praise God. Remember Hezekiah? Who was the king of Judah, right? He fell sick. The prophet came and told me, you're going to die with such and such a disease. He said, no, me, I'm a righteous man. I'm a good man. God, God, me, you know me. I want 15 more years. 15, and it was given to him. This is a man who knows his authority. He has his identity intact. By the time you can tell God, we know there's no man righteous, right? All are fallen short. By the time you can tell God, me, I'm righteous. My God, you must really be righteous. Me, I cannot tell God, me, I'm righteous. I can't. But he was able to tell God and God listened to him. So this, I told you, Judah, the tribe of Judah is kind of a priest of sorts, a spiritual leader. Let's use the word spiritual leader because we'll be contradicting the Levitical priesthood. But this, like we said, Reuben was supposed to have all those blessings, but because of his folly, it was distributed. Now, this one, because of his strength, many things were given to him to back up his strength. So many times you may have one strength and God will give you many more other things to hold you together. Like a car, the engine is powerful, but it needs tires. An engine is very fast, but you need wipers when it's raining. Without wipers, you can't drive. However, allows the wipers seal. All together. Praise God. That is Hezekiah. Now, you know, after Hezekiah, there's Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. These were all from the tribe of Judah. We, okay, we say Daniel wasn't a prophet. A man given to reading the Bible and uh, studying the word. And he had deep revelation. I still say Daniel is a prophet, but I'll teach it to you. In terms of theology, they say he wasn't. Why do I say he wasn't? To encourage you to read the prophets, to study the word and pray, and you will still have revelation. Because many of us want to leave revelation knowledge to prophets. And I'm saying, no, anybody can have revelation knowledge. Prophet or no prophet. But basically, this people's story, we know it. That this man, Daniel was told not to pray to his God. But because of who he is, because of the character in him, he said, no, if I die, I die. I will still praise God. The law was decreed not to pray at a certain time, but he did. Eventually, the kingdom worshipped his God, right? Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, they told the king that you're putting us in fire. We know our God will rescue us. But if he doesn't, we shall still worship him. Do you have that kind of resolve? Altogether. If it was Reuben... I don't think it would have worked. This guy said, our God will rescue us from the fire. But if he doesn't, we are still going to praise him. We are still going to worship him. We are still going to serve him. So today, if you have a circumstance around you, please don't give up on God. The loss can only be yours. And yet all gain is waiting for you. Praise the living God. You remember Jehoshaphat? Many of us know it from Chronicles, 2 Chronicles 20, 20. Let's read the scripture for in this case. Let me read it for you. 2 Chronicles 20, 20. 
We all know 2020. And they arose early in the morning and went forth in the wilderness of Tekoa. As they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall ye be established. Believe his prophets, and ye shall prosper. Next. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord that they should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army and to say, praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. Now, this is their warfare. You remember like the mother, she said, God has given me Judah. I've praised God. She praised God and she gave him, gave her Judah. Now, these Jude, people from Judah, they are their weapon of warfare is worship. They are going for war, but they have selected men to lead a procession leading with worshippers. Next verse. And when they had begun to sing and praise and to praise, the Lord set ambushment against the children of Ammon and Moab and, and Mount Sire, which were come against Judah, and they were smitten. These people were killed. The Lord is the one who fought this war. They, they, them they were singing or worshipping. Worshipping is not necessarily singing. But let us say they were worshipping and praising. For the children of Ammon, Ammon and Moab stood against the inhabitants of Mount Sire utterly to slay and destroy them. And when they had made an end to the inhabitants, Inhabitants of Sire, everyone helped to destroy one another. After killing the enemy, the other enemy, these two tribes turned against each other and killed themselves, and they all died. 25. Okay, and when Judah came toward, came toward the, watch, the watchtower in the wilderness, they looked unto the multitude and beheld they were dead bodies fallen to the earth, and none escaped. Next verse. That is clear. And when Jehoshaphat and his people came to take away the spoil, the loot, or the precious things these people had, they found among them in abundance both riches and dead, with dead bodies and precious jewels which they stripped off for themselves more than they could carry away. And they were three days in gathering the spoil. It was so much. Praise God. This is the tribe of Judah. What was their weapon of warfare? Worship. What was the temperament of the mother when going to conceive him or giving back to him? It was worship. She was no longer looking for the favor of her husband. And now you see that this thing continues. It continues in them. It continues in them. So today I say, when you have an identity, you are safe. How together. When you have an identity, you are safe. Do not give up your identity. They'll come looking for the identity, not you. Those who are not here in the morning intercession, we shared about Rebecca. When she was asked, who are you? She did not say, I'm Rebecca. She said, I am the daughter of so and so and so and so and so and so. And the servant who was sent to find a wife of Isaac was not looking for Rebecca, was looking for a girl with so, such and such and such and such, a certain identity. Praise God. So we say, be patient. Be patient. God is with you. Amen? And as for the mothers who have had Leah, you've had what? The sons, Reuben, who and who and who and who? Rachel cried to the husband, give me children or I die. The husband said, am I God? But later on, she had Joseph. And was in Joseph greater than all of them? Yes, he was. But then we also have Judah. Praise the living God. Praise God. Then you've heard of Josiah. Josiah was a, became king at eight years. And he was responsible for, for bringing religious reforms. He broke he broke down and forbade idol worship. He did a good work. He was also from the tribe of Judah. 
Then we know David, right? Tribe of Judah. We know Solomon and Nathan. Nathan is a son of David, and uh, Solomon is also a son of David. The lineage of Jesus comes from Nathan, not necessarily Solomon, but we'll say even Solomon. Solomon ended up in idol worship. Nathan, the lineage, came up to Joseph. I think this is a conversation I was having with Laura, and I think I gave her the wrong name. Now we are, we are together, right? Praise God. But there are two, the lineage of Jesus is from two lines, from Solomon and also from Nathan. Praise God. And I'm going to, I'll dare, say some, I'll dare to say something. Why Mary is the mother of Jesus? I will say, if I'm brave enough, some things, the revelation I have, my, my, it might challenge some people. Praise God. So, we are together. So clearly, Ju Judah is a person of noble character or a tribe of noble character. They are leaders. They are able to stand alone. They don't need, they don't need, uh, I don't know what word we use, cheerleaders. They are people of influence. They are people of authority. They are people of power. They are people who think they are intelligent. They are people who have strategy in everything that they do. They are patient. The person that is patient is a person that can strategize. If you're all over the place, you'll be like Reuben. Kill my two children if I don't bring Benjamin back. Praise God. Okay. This is the problem of Judah. This is the problem of Judah. We read in Genesis 24, 15, 15, 16 possibly, where it says that uh, Rebecca was fair to look at. She was beautiful. Now, Genesis chapter 12, verse 10, it talks about how Abraham loved fair women. Out together. Now, his problem doesn't come from his father's word. It now comes from before. You can give me Genesis. I may not read it. I may not read it. But if we see it quickly, we will. Okay, Abraham, the problem of Judah comes from his father, grandfathers. Abraham, the Bible says, loved fair women. And as you go along, you find in Genesis 20, Abraham, okay, fine. In this chapter, you're going to find that Abraham had a wife. She was very beautiful. And he went to a certain land and was a king in that land. And they wanted to take his wife because she was beautiful. And they lied that she is sister. But she was, it was also not a lie. The second king in Genesis 20 also sees this beautiful woman and does the same thing. This same thing happens with Isaac also. He also loved fair women. The Bible says he kissed Rebecca. Was it Isaac or Jacob? It was Isaac, I believe. Who kissed and cried? Jacob. It was Jacob. Now, but you're going to find that this family line, they loved a particular trait. Altogether, they love the particular traits. And if you examine yourself, even you, when you're choosing a partner, there is a particular trait that you like. That's why they say, people who cannot sustain a relationship, you're going to, the next person you meet, you're still looking for the same traits, the old person. Am I lying? Today, what we're saying is, the challenge of Judah was they loved fair women. We are going to read scripture, I believe. Some scriptures, I don't know. Okay. Let's read Genesis 26, 7 to 12. That one is short. So Abraham loved fair women. Isaac loved fair women. Jacob, the story remains the same. Now, Judah is a son of... Praise God. Okay, and the man of the place asked him of his wife, and he said, she's my sister, for he feared to say she is my wife, lest, lest the man of the place should kill me for Rebecca because she was fair to look upon. And it came to pass when he had been there, okay, the story continues, the king of that place saw Isaac walking with, 
with, uh, with his wife and came to him that surely no, this one is your wife. The way you're walking, you look each one another. Yeah? You look like, have you ever been with somebody and even when you say this is my friend, people know that uh, uh, you're lying. Something like that. So I'll leave that story and continue to save our time, right? And in this case, Abimelech, in verse 11, he commanded all the people saying that anyone who touches the wife of this man shall be put to death. Right? And then verse 12, the Bible says, Then Isaac sowed in that land, and he received in the same year a hundredfold. And the Lord blessed him. Yes, it is in the sowing. Right? But there was peace with him and those people because of his wife. After they identified this is his wife, they had peace. And may I like to say, do you know that there are people you meet in your life and your life multiplies and your life becomes fruitful? In this case, I'm saying this is Isaac's wife. Remember, we already talked about her. She was from a good family. She was honorable. They blessed her. Remember, they told her she will have a thousand times, a million times this and that and that, her descendants. Now, here it is. Isaac, fine, is a son of a blessed man and is also blessed. But a ble blessing has made a blessing. All together. So the man began to multiply. What is a thousand, a hundredfold? A hundredfold, let, let's use your salary. A hundredfold is you getting your salary for the whole, okay. How do I put it? This is a year, right? All your paycheck, all your salary for those who have jobs for the year, multiply it a hundred times, but you get it in that first year. You can run mad, right? Depending on your salary. All because of an identity. If you have an identity, fruitfulness will follow you. And this is a principle. It's not because you're born again. Fruitfulness will follow you. Honor your father and your mother and you'll have length of days. Not just living long, the beauty of life. That even when Isaac's mother died, the Bible says his wife was a source of comfort to him. You tell your wife, you know, mommy has gone, but at least you're here. Some people, they wish that you're the one who dies. But if God can just help me. <laughs> so, have your identity. You will be a source of comfort. The only source of comfort anyone should have is the Holy Ghost. But a woman and the Holy Spirit are equated. Don't misunderstand me. They do the same work. All together. You can come to church and you're filled with power. Then you go home and there's no comfort. That power will disappear. So wives, be the source of comfort. Be peaceable. Be calm. Praise the living God. We're together. Praise God. Now, we're going to read the whole chapter. After that chapter, I think everything else will be a little easier. I hope. We're going to read the whole chapter, Genesis 38. I can tell you the story, or we can read. You tell me. Okay. And it came to pass that Judah went down from his brethren and turned into a certain... A Dulamite whose name was Hira or Hira. And Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua, and he took her and went in unto her. Okay. And she conceived that bear a son, and he called his name that one. And she conceived again and bear a son and called his name Onan. And she yet again conceived and bare a son and called his name Shelah. And he was at Shezib 
when she bare him. And Judah took a wife, took a wife for her firstborn, whose name was Tamar. Just hold it. Now, Judah already had a wife. Yeah? Judah already had a wife. But he went and just picked a random, okay, let me say a random woman, and had three sons with her. Already there is a problem. Then had three sons, right? And now this is where the story really becomes nice. So he got a wife for his son. And the wife was called Tamar. Now we continue. And a Judah's firstborn was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord slew him. The Lord killed him. <laughs> God used not to play. Okay. Next. And Judah said unto Onan, Go and in unto your brother's wife and marry her and raise up seed to thy brother. Take note of that. We are going to discuss that. And Judah said, okay. Verse 9. And Onan knew that the seed should not be his and it came to pass when he went in unto her and to his brother's wife, he spilled it on the ground lest that he should give seed to his brother. Ten. And the thing which he did displeased the Lord. Where, wherefore he slew him also. Praise God. Now, you remember when we talked about Reuben? We talked about recrimination. Incrimination is clear. You're incriminating some. Recrimination is you're creating you're doing sin after sin or crime, lesser crime, what we want to call maybe lesser crime, to cover up the original crime. All together. Now, here, everything seems to be going bad and God just keeps killing these people. But it all started badly. It started with Judah. Then said Judah unto Tamar, his daughter-in-law, remain a widow at thy father's house till Shelah, my son, be grown. For he, ha he said lest perhaps you, he die also and his, his brethren, as his brethren did. And Tabar went and dwelt in her father's house. In the process of time, the daughter, the daughter of Shua, Judah's wife. Now we can identify that Judah actually did have a wife, aside from the Adulamite, Adul, Adulamite woman. Died and Judah was comforted and went up unto the ship sharers to Timnah and he and his friends and his friend Hira, they are Dulamites. Okay. And it was told Tabah, saying, Behold, thy father, the father in law goes up to Timnah to share his ship. And she put her, wid her widow's garment on. She put her widow's garment off from her and covered her with a veil and wrapped herself and sat sat in an open place, which is by the way to Timna, for she saw that Shela was grown and she was not given unto him to wife. She's setting a trap. The little boy the father promised has now grown and she has not been given to him. So she's trying to set a trap. You call it Quetega. Yeah? Okay, next. When Judah saw her, he thought her to be a prostitute or a harlot because she had covered her face. Now, remember we said there's a garment for Fidro? She removed the garment for Fidros. For, for the widow's garment, right? She removed it. Now, the garment she wore is a garment of a harlot. Now, together. Now, keep in mind that this guy comes from a lineage where they love fair women. Most halots, we, they will make the assumption the word is fair. Fair does, okay, fair does not mean brown. But fair, in this case, for me, is attractive. Okay, and he turned unto her, by the way, and said, Go to, I pray thee, let me come in unto you. For he knew not that she was his daughter-in-law and said, what will thou give me 
that thou mayest come unto me. Amen? So this woman is clever. And he said, I will send thee a kid from the flock. And she said, will thou give me a pledge till thou send it? And he said, what pledge shall I give thee? And he said, thy signet and thy bracelet and thy staff that is in thy heart. And he gave, her, gave it to her and came in unto her and she conceived by him. Now, a signet is a ring of authority. Now together, take me back a little bit. Bracelet. We remember Rachel, was it Rachel? Rebecca was given a bracelet. And then a symbol, basically like these are gifts given to when you're going to marry. And then the staff. That is the scepter, the thing I told you. Right? Remember it is taught, the scripture says the scepter shall not depart from the house of Judah. Now, in this case, it has actually departed. Altogether. So, this man also, he is losing all the authority God has placed in him. All the prophecy of his father. If it were not for the word that was pronounced for his father, even Judah would have failed. Altogether. I tell you today, do not forget prophetic language, don't forget scripture, because even when you stagger and fall and fail, that word will uphold you. The scepter shall not depart from the house of Judah. I'm going to show you a scripture that will help us understand why even when this woman took this, it did not actually go. So some of you, you have, I'm teaching a message which is right and wrong. Some of you have grace that there are certain mistakes you will make but because of your identity, you are safe. Remember, his sons have been killed by God, killed by God for doing wrong. But he's doing wrong and it is passing him over because he has an origin. He has a father who spoke. He did not speak over his children, so they were killed. So today, the safety of your children, both natural and spiritual, is in your mouth. Are we together? And they will not lose that thing which you have given unto them because prophetic words are life. They don't die. And they have partial fulfillment. They have natural fulfillment. They have spiritual fulfillment. And they have repetitive fulfillment. If I tell you you're going to have a car, a particular car, you will have that car. When the new version comes, you'll get the new version. When the other version comes, you'll get another version. And another version. And people are like, you, you're a guy of Jeep. But you have every jeep that can be had. Then you wonder, but they said only one jeep. There is repetitive fulfillment. We are understanding each other. There is also partial fulfillment. That something is fulfilled now. We give you one word that you are a man of real estate. You build one house. It's not done. It's partial. You build another, and another, and another, and another, till you build a worker's house. And people are like, but this man, the word is still being fulfilled, and it will spill over to your generations. Are we understanding each other? Praise the living God. So I tell you, do not play with your identity. Do not play with the blessing of your mother, your father. Do not play with the blessing of your spiritual parent. It will keep you even when you don't deserve it. Unmerited favor in this case. But grace is different. Have we understood each other? Praise the living God. So here, this is the part where he lost all of it. He actually did. Let's continue. And she arose and went away and laid by her veil and laid by her veil from her and put on the garments of the widowhood. So there is a garment for everything. Many times when you go for a wedding they have to unveil you, right? That's the garment for your marriage. Jacob, the reason he married the wrong wife is because she was veiled 
in the dark. So please enter into his marvelous light and the veil shall be opened. Your eyes shall be opened. The light of your understanding shall, 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 shall keep on shining and lead you. You will not have to work twice for the same thing. Praise the living God. And Judah sent the kid. Now he's fulfilling his pledge. He's an honorable man. Remember we say Judah is honorable, right? Send the kid by the hand of his friend, the Adulamite, and receive, to receive his pledge from the woman's hand. But he found her not. Now the, the signet, the bracelet, and the scepter are missing. So even Judah failed. And yet there was no weakness in him. Then he asked the men that men of that place saying, Where is the halot that was openly by the wayside? And they say there was no halot in this place. And he returned to Judah and said, I cannot find her. And also the men of the place said, said that there was no halot in this place. And Judah said, Let her take it to her, lest we be shame. Behold, I sent this kid and thou hast not found her. Now he's regretting more or less, right? And it came to pass about, about three months after that it was told Judah, saying, Tamar, thy daughter-in-law, has played the harlot, and also, behold, she is with child by the whoredom. And Judah said, Bring her forth and let her be burnt. Authority now. Kill the secret. Kill the secret. When she was brought forth, she sent to her father-in-law, saying, by the, by the man, whose these are? Whose these? Whose? <laughs> English. Basically, I'm with child. And she said, the son, I pray thee, who's these, okay, okay, whose signet is this, the bracelet and the stuff? You discern. Amen? She's basically saying, spare my life. These things are yours. It is you. You're the criminal. We continue. And Judah acknowledged them and said, she has been more righteous than I. He has now recognized. She has been more righteous than I because that I gave her not to Shalom, my son, and he knew her again no more. I don't know. I think I can stop there. Okay. There are twins in her womb. Who did she bring forth? Continue next. And it came to pass. I think you'll continue the story. You'll continue. But the midwife bound the scarlet thread. All this is significant of Christ now. It's a shadow of Christ. And we're saying that in the lineage of Jesus, both the Gentiles and the Jews, all the righteous and unrighteous, are already inside there. And through Tabar, we have access. All together. And I'm saying sometimes your folly is not what determines your righteousness. It's God's word. God, you're exactly who God has said you are. Amen? Like Judah. He's exactly who the prophet said he was. Even when he failed, he still stood. His sons were killed for doing possibly even less than he has done. But God sustained him. Praise the living God. And we're saying, Judah actually lost the scepter. With all his honor. And we're saying, this was a man that was perfect. A man that had no, no weakness. But he had a seed that was hidden within him. Praise the living God. Praise the living God. Now, in Matthew chapter 1, I want to prove to you. Okay, do I do Matthew yet? Okay, give me Deuteronomy 23. 
Deuteronomy 23, verse 2. Now, this is why Judah did not lose the scepter. He lost it, yes, but he also did not lose it. He did not lose it because his father prophesied. But there is this word here. A bastard shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord, even to the, his tenth generation shall he not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Give me the next verse. That's all I need, but next verse. An Ammonite or Moabite shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord, even their tenth generation shall they not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Now, when we go to Hezekiah, first, Second Chronicles 20, 20, we, are, we read how the Ammonites and the Moabites killed each other. They had no access. And were saying, because the bastard had no right, the same right that Judah, the same right Judah had, he had a birthright. They had no birthright. So that is one of the reasons the scepter could not get lost. Altogether, we are going to read scripture to show which son did Judah give birth to, bring forth with Tamar. And then you'll see that for 10 generations, the Bible says up to the 10th generation, right? Up to the 10th generation, they will not enter. If there was a bastard on the 11th, he would enter. All together. Now, give me Matthew chapter 1. The Bible is used to enjoy. This book of, this, okay, the book of the generations of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, verse 2. Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat, begat Jacob. Yes, and Jacob begat, ah, uh, back, begat Jacob, and Jacob begat, begat Judas and his brethren. Now, remember, Judah is now Judas. We're together. Now, now Judah is the first, right? We are counting 10 generations. We are counting 10 generations. Okay, Judas, verse 3. And Judas begat Phares. Phares was those, those sons that he got. And, and Phares and Zara of, of Tamar. And Phares begat Ethro, es, Esrom. And Esrom begat Aram. Now, I'm going to read from here. So Judas is one, Esrom is two, Aram is three, and Aram begat Aminadab. That is four. Aminadab, Nasom, that is five. And then it goes to Boaz. Then from Boaz he begat Obed, and Obed begat Jesse, David's father. And David took the throne. He became the first king. All together. This is in the Bible. So, remember, a bastard shall not take the throne. But guess what? David is number 10. But so is up to 10. But before David, there was the king of the men, Saul. So that was the 10th king. So now from 11, we have David. So the kingdom of Judah is restored. There's nothing redundant in the Bible. I need us to know that. Are we clear so far? That yes, Judah lost the scepter, but because of the prophetic word, it survived. And because of this word, this is also a prophetic word, the one that says the bastard shall not enter. So if he had married Tamar, there would be, the kingdom would be restored possibly. And that's why you find that usually children who are born from, say, second mothers, third mother, fourth mother, mother, the ones who are not married, even if you're the firstborn and your mother was not married, you're going to find you're going to struggle with birthright. It's biblical. You find that this is the firstborn, first woman, but she was not married. The birthright overlaps you. You've seen these things, right? It's from the Bible. Praise the living God. Praise the living God. And now from David, David had, okay, many children, but there is one called Nathan, and then there is Solomon. The, the, the lineage continues through Nathan up to Joseph. 
then also continue, continues through Solomon, I believe up to Joseph or up to Mary. So you, you'd say that Jesus has two lineages. Out together. Solomon ended up in idol worship. These ones were, were, were well to speak of. So today, all this is so that we can be absorbed. The word is engrafted or grafted in that we may also have access. The weave continued until we were given access. So you're going to start understanding why some people suffer a lot and some even when they should suffer, they don't suffer. Because they have identity. Many of us have not understood this thing called parenthood and sonship. It is very, very crucial when it comes to the word of God. Praise the living God. Praise the living God. Now, there is a scripture again I want to show you. We're going to first read a few. John the Baptist and Seed. That is Luke 3.16. I'll read quickly. John answered saying unto them all, Indeed, I, bapt I, bapt I indeed baptize you with water. I indeed baptize you with water. But one mightier than I cometh. The latchet of whose shoe I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. Now many of us, we just read the Bible, right? And bypass that. Praise the living God. That is very significant in the Bible. It's repeated in Acts chapter 13, 25. The Bible says, and as John fulfilled his, his course, he said, whom think ye that I am? I am not he, but behold, there comes another whose shoes I am not worthy to loose. TMS people already know this, but I'm still sharing it. We are going to read Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 5 to 12. Praise the living God. We're still attacking birthright. We're still attacking birthright. I can tell you the story, but let's read it. From verse 5. If, if brethren dwell together and one of them die and have no child, the wife of the dead shall not marry without without unto a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go in unto her and take her to his wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother unto her. We've just read that about Judah's sons, right? But they refused to fulfill this law. This was a law. Much as Judah, this is Genesis, we say the law was not yet there. But we're seeing that we have been lying to ourselves. Whether Genesis is before the law, these things transcend, they cross over. Amen? Okay, and it shall be that the firstborn which, her, which she bear shall concede, or rather shall succeed in the name of his brother which is dead, this, that his name be not put out of Israel. So this is about preserving seed. That's why God is critical about lineage. And if the man, and if the man like not to take his brother's wife, then let his brother's wife go up to the gates of the elders and say, my husband's brother refuses to raise up unto his brother a name in Israel. He will not perform the duty of a husband, of, a, of my husband's brother. Then the elders of the city shall call him and speak unto him. And if he stand to it and say, I, I like not to take her, then shall his brother's wife come unto him in the presence of the elders and loose his shoe and loose his shoe from off his foot and spit in the face in his face and shall answer and say so shall it be done unto the man that will not build up his brother's house 10 and his name shall be called and his name shall be called in Israel the house of him that has his shoe loose. 
That is about lineage. This one, just addition. When a man strife, when two men fight, and the wife of one comes to help her husband, right? And the Bible says here, and the wife that dwells near comes to deliver her husband out of the hand of him that smites him, and puts forth her hand and take him by the secrets, by the private parts. Twelve. Thou shalt cut off her hand. Thine eye shall have no pity upon her. This is how serious God is about preserving seed. But he has said the bastard shall not provide seed. Now, back to the New Testament. When John the Baptist says he's not worthy to lose shoe of Jesus. He's basically saying he cannot save. He's not the savior. He cannot provide seed. We are seed of Christ. He cannot provide seed for the Christ. Jesus himself is able to provide his own seed. And even when he dies, he will sprout out again. He shall live again. Praise the living God. That is a message for somebody. Today, there are a couple of things I've shared that if you take them, you're safe. We shall stop copy and paste. We shall stop fearing. But I say today, we're talking about the tribe of Judah, but I've taken you a little further than that, and we're talking about identity. These were identified as the sons of Jacob, and his words kept him. Even when he failed, those words kept him. He failed to provide word for his children, and they were killed. He made mistakes because there's original sin that he's also looking for a particular thing and finds a prostitute look alike. Those are his weaknesses that are not shown in the prophecy of his father. Praise the living God. So, the Bible says, when there is no king, or I would say Judges, the easiest scripture I'd give you is Judges 21 25. There are many scriptures like that. Judges 17 6. Judges 18.1, Judges 19.1, Judges 21.25, the Bible says in those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own sight. But be sure in the sight of God it was not right. Praise the living God. Praise the living God. And then we know in 1 Samuel, I'm not going to read, 1 Samuel 8, 1 to 6. This is the part where the time, the spell of the judges was ending. Samuel was the last judge. And he was preparing his sons to take over. But his sons were not living the right way. And the elders refused. They said, no, get us a king. Now the tenth king. Now, guess what? The tenth king is Saul. Saul was a Benjamite. Also representing... Gentiles. Much as this is from Israel. He was a Benjamite, the 10th king, and then David was the 11th. Or rather, in terms of generations, we counted names, right? So, here it is today that uh, when these guys rejected Samuel's leadership as a judge, he was offended and he cried to God, and God said, in rejecting you, it is him that they have rejected. Give them the man that they want. And they gave them Saul. Saul was a Benjamite. Fine. From the Benjamite tribe, you find that Saul in the New Testament is also a Benjamite. And you know that a lot of knowledge was committed to him to bring to us. So, while Saul seemed to have failed in his assignment, the old one, even the new Saul was doing his assignment the wrong way. And God corrected him. So, at the end of the day, I don't know if you call Saul one with weaknesses. In the end, remember Saul, the Old Testament called David his son and blessed him. And that's how David took over the throne. So the very thing that may afflict you is the very thing that is also teaching you. But if you have no idea, you don't know your identity, you'll not be able to learn from the mistakes or the pain that you have carried on your shoulder. Altogether, not every bad thing that comes to you is bad. Sometimes it comes to you for teaching. Amen? We have clearly identified the scepter was lost and it was not lost. And yet the ones who were supposedly the sons of Judah were killed for doing wrong and yet Judah was not. 
The one who should have been punished is Judah. And we're saying today, do not lose your identity. Please do not lose your identity. True, there is no man righteous, but there are men that God calls righteous. The Bible says, every word spoken against you, you shall condemn. No weapon fashioned against you shall prosper. Every word spoken against you, you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of God. Are you a servant of God before you start claiming spiritual warfare? You've seen how the tribe of Judah fought. They did not fight with weapons. They fought with worship. God himself is able to raise you seed. God himself is able to preserve you. We look at did Rebecca again. She simply kept her identity and a man was sent, led of the edge of God, to find her. So today, don't press the panic button yet. The people who built houses 10 years ago and you have not built, don't panic because you are obese, you are in the same class. They be sure the design of their house is now old. You have a better opportunity, right? I'm simply saying there is always hope. Do not lose your identity. Praise the living God. This is the word of the Lord. I hope somebody has taken something home. You know, I teach and I don't know if you're learning or not. But the way I know you're learning is not in you coming to tell me that I've learned. It is in you demonstrating what you know. Amen? Who is here for the first time? Don't fear. One, two, three, four, five. Can you stand up? 